Tata ki rata ko huki, tata yo no no. Ki a mata i hui mai nei te hunga ora te na koutou te na koutou te na tata katoa ko hui tara kia kia ko hui tara niti. Wakati ra kei duga. Te mehi tu ata hiki a koe i te fananga o a kuki a ni. Nau te taki, hei karanga i a mātou ki rotu i tēnei whare a tāhona re mihi kawake ki a koe o tira ki tō tō rōpū tautoko, mihi kawake e mihi kawake ki a koe. E wi, mihi kawana ki a koe, nau te karakia hei timata tēnei hui hui ngō tātou, mihi kawana, me ngā mihi, Ki a patu hohepa, ai, tikana te kōrero, roa te wā ka noho ai, ki roti tērā au ngā whare, ko tōna rangatiratanga, tōna mahi, tāna rangahau, ki roti tō tātou nei kaupapa o ngā puhi tanga, nō reira, ka te hari tonu ngā mihi ki a ai, e patu haere, haere, haere atu rā. Oi ho, Mā tātou, ngā uri o te taitokirau, o te Aotearoa, o ngā moana. Oi ho mā mātou, hei tutuki pai i ngā wawata o kuia mā, o kraua mā. Ki roto i tēnei whare wānanga, ki roto i ngā whare wānanga katoa o te motu. Nō reira, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Ai mihi mai ki a mātou, mihi mai ki a mātou ngā kai kōrero i tēnei pō, harikoa, au te tautoko, te tono ki a noho ki roti i tēnei whare, hei whakawhitiwhiti kōro e pānana, me pēhe ka whakatū wāhi ki roto i ngā taone nui, hei oranga mō tātou katoa. Ngā wāhi kia taia e koe te kite, a, ko ngā ti whātua tērā, ko ngā ti pāua tērā ko ngā kuki aerini tērā. Tērā te tino kaupapa o tēnei ope, o tēnei rōpū, ki a aki-aki ai i wera mahi ki roto i ngā kaunihera, i roto i te kawana tanga huki. Kia kite ai, a mātou kanohi ki roto i a mātou wāhi. Nō reira, i rungi taua kaupapa, te nā koutou, a te nā koutou, a kero ko iwi, ai tātou, katoa. E aloha, e whakakono, e te rangi mai, e tātou, tātou e. Ivan Merset, nāna i hoahua tēnei whare, nāna hoki i hoahua ngā whare ki te tari Māori, ki Waipapa Taumatarau. Me ona pūkenga, ona humārie, kei te whare tūnu ngā mihi ki aia. Nō reira, āpiti hono tātai hono rātau ki a rātau kua wehe ki te pō, āpiti hono tātai hono tātau nei ngā kanohi ora o Aotearoa. O te moana nui a kiwa, tātou ki a tātou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, kia ora hui hui mai tātou katoa. Kā hui. Ona fasili ai leo tangaloa, deli, 
ya laulu laulu wana mia kifaku wa yao kiki ole tali na de li ile o laulu la usuma le tanga loa ulupe ye sa bao ese ese ole fu fu fa kasi oke manga e fa penga ge ya so marka ko fa mo mo ya se a o ma le lo fa ma la na le o ka ko ka pa si di la e ye le ka ko mo e ma o ka ka ave ma la ka ave i mo ko ka ka se pa spika ku lo ma ku pu a mo ma ka ko fa mo ku lo ma fo ma la e mo ma le o ma la e ku lo ma fo le fa le mo lo ma ka mo fa le Ai mo mo pe lama mo fa ku lo le kuwa wa le kuwa yo le mana mana ma lo si me mo lava o le kuwa e o le aso ma le ta tu fa mo mo ku lo ku lo ma lava ku lo ma va ki kele e fiku e fiku va ki kele a o te lo le sa mo i malai i ele le sa mo le fumua ngi o sa i e fiku sa ami mai ka aka ma uli mai mo ana Ingei ao te roa. Kulonga ka kele o tanui. Kulonga te awara. Kulonga oe matatua. Aya ka kele o kura ka upo. Tulou. Tulonga ka kele ya toko mali. Kulonga oe atea. Ha. Aya ka kele lesa fauwao. Faupo isabai. Kulonga oe takitimu. Kulonga lava. Kulonga oe motu taitasi. Itonga, kore keu hufanga he talamalu e fanua, tapo mo tata fengu. Tapo mo ha lotu, tapo mo e fa nau haweki. Tapo mo ha tau hi fanua, tapo mo ha matapule, tapo mo ha potu, tapo mo ha tufunga. Kaya ta ke whakahoko, a e whakongia kua whata, ko loa akiyau tulong, tulong na lapa. Ia mo fa pele ka ko kepa i le moko sa moa ko longa tama mala to aina aina mala ko tama ta ta fole ma mo mo ma ki songa ya tu mo mo pole i tu au mala ta wa i ngere ta i mala ba a fonti ia a fio suo mo fai fo mo fo ma i tu langi mala la mi usai bua ka ma mo mo kere ko ko or fa le ula or le me mo ni lava le wa ko or fa le ka ka i ma mo malu ka we e fo le ki a ma mia a mo fa pele se Kwa mkalana, ya sumaya, fiyo maya, maliwe maya, makana mayo kwa au. Ya vela ulewa fai masuyo ni mbeskea o kilangi, ya mese foe le sumai, kama kai konga foma ya shamein. E fafelo haya alo ia kwa ipa ia mama maru li ngai kuwa le maru, ya mese lua sase lua, le li fangu. Opa ia ia fasingo ya tuisa amore, kapa au fasinga mle usali. Kau si ba kele ya filofi marko valo kau lau ni. Ah, ayah lau sunga lau. Opa iya iya na pui, mana hau ay polo pui pui koko uli aku malai. Fa pefo ni so sweet temari temari tay pule yo fisa lewo tato lau go fisi lo fa ingai pula na fiaf. Ay saya, omo saya aku ponga ponga wala na ilu makaku kaku pasifik mau ni ingai alte gua. Vi iya lekua. Ya, ni mana saya singa ni kuar mana? Ya, oleh kau kau fakasi mersum ya ni lauli, lauli oleh mari kua. Ya, oleh suai kau kau ikut dia orang aku siapa kau ingsi ni yang ni, fa pengen, fa oleh memalu si ese, okay mengaku. Ya, oleh kau fengai singa ula, oleh kau ikut kau kau filo ilu mungu elu kua mu mu wah oleh mu po. Ya, oleh mesi ni lah kau kau filo fia fia lu fak mu. Ya Allah bagi kamu semua, semua sekarang kau faham kalau kuat kuat angan-angan dia itu malu faham. Sebab kamu pernah lakukan pokok kata, ini kamu memang wira ni faham boleh boleh. Ya faham kalau dia kuat kuat kamu faham yang PPCP PPCP kuat kalau pasifik ni asu. Kamu faham perlu semua aku dengan kuat dia bukan kuat lebih sila faham. Apa faham faham? Apa kuli? Ya kaku halu yang kamu ada kaku halu yang kamu ya kamu feluah kaku kah? Kaku kaka iya le, mana hari ya makaku ingat universiti ya makaku walau lalu lagi makaku kau, kau pengen sekala mahu ya kaku apa? We will now, so I'll give a little bit of a spiel maybe when when we do the introductions, but 
Um, there's now a, just a fellowship, a quick fellowship with the Manuhiri, and then we'll get underway with our program in terms of the other. Okay. I think all the, the oratory has been done and I won't add any more. I'm just going to speak to this part of the Kappa ceremony and how we all want to try and drink out of the one bowl and the engagement in this is the oneness from our, our Pacific, um, Pacific beliefs and Pacific traditions. However, uh, we're weary of the time, we're weary of many other factors. So we have many servants and we're not going to allow one culture to dominate, but we will allow uh, Jamaah just to facilitate this process. And when you receive your cup, they will take two steps back and they will respect you and honour you by clap, whereby then you can consume the cover. And we've told the, the server, make sure it's right up to the room for our manuhiri, that's how they love it. Uh, we'll start off with the six, the first six, and then we'll continue with the, the final four. And just for those on the, on the front, they're representing all of our manuhiri today. Before it comes back onto to our side, the Rako comes back onto our side. Similar traditions, similar customs, uh, just different ways of doing it. Um, and then we will conclude. Once the, again, uh, once, they, they, once our side has finished consuming, and we'll just take just the front row, again, just to represent all of the hosts. And here at the Waikapa Tomatago, the number one university in all of Auckland and New Zealand. Uh, and then we will conclude with our Waiata and then bring this part to the end. So, so. Can I have a ghost cup? I'm happy. Oh, I think this is going to make your baby even more strong. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, it's a good part, eh? Thank you for that. There's no, um, there's no compulsion for you to drink. Just an acknowledgement. If you want to do a mihi uh, before you consume, that, that's all. Just even in uh, just saying cheers and acknowledging the gesture that us as uh, hosts mm. uh, are offering over to you. When we are level that okay. Um just before we get underway, thank you, uh Lemoir. If our panelists, our six panelists can also introduce yourselves, please.
Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ke koutou i te pōhiri ki Paramai ki tōnei, ki tēnei hui, he miharo ki te noko reote i tēnei whale. Tēnā koutou haere au ki konei i mua, ki oi kaori ki tētahi kaupapa, koe ne hoki wātu o tahi ki Paramai ki tētahi kaupapa konei. Ko Jeka ki tōku i mua, he ure hei o Ngātohi, a hokoa he tangata tino kahahau ki te taho o Ngātohi, Kei whangarei au e noko ana, no te whakatohia no te arawa hoki a hau, ki te taho tōku māma te katoa o tuku whakapapa Māori, ki oi ki te taho o tōku pāpā no horana no uruki mātou. Ai, he kai taku mahi, ko i te ringa tōku kaihau tūme ki o tētahi pākihi pōkoa no Māori, ki whangarei, ko o mata kohe pōhonga me tōku kāta ingoa, I te hakitaima kei te wānanga aranui o Tamaki Mukaurau e mahi ana, hei poako mātua, mahi hau ki a hau, he oi tino pai ki te tīmata, ki te whaka ako i te mahi koa oanga ki te tahi reanga anō. Ki te taha anō, he kai tuhi a hau, i pota te tahi pukupuka i tēra o tēra atu wiki, kāna ki a Rewi Thompson, i mahi ia ki konei hei poako, hei kai hoa hoa whare ia, ai, mena ka ki te kai tei te pukupuka, me pānui, me hoko pia. Tēnā kai te katoa. Tēnā kai te katoa. Tūre i atu nei Awamare Whānau Tini, a rea rau reo e whaima sūra mātou waenga ma mātou au whaima wenga o Mau Studio. Te whātaro whātou ma whawhailo ai atu pe ia ma mau tātou ma whutanga. Oro i ngō atu kutau, o tau le la unu, e la la mātua mai sāmo o pō Ngāti Hāmo Whoi. Lō tina e a la la mai sale i lua i whalea lili, lō tima e a la la mai Pau Tasi, Mau Wai, Whalea Lili, Ma Ngātai Wai, A Palauri Ngātai Wai. So, really nice to meet everyone. My name is Tal from Mau Studio. Camera's really close up, love it. It's a privilege to be here and absolutely honoured to be a part of this panel of my dear friends but also my dear mentors as I've journeyed throughout this architectural profession or career or whatever I've made of it. So, looking forward to sharing today and thank you again to our hosts our kaikara kia and also our aumanga here as part of this whole, as part of our night tonight. Kia ora. Mālau nei everyone, my name is Mālau Atalanga of Moana. I was born in Waihi to my father Moseso of Moana. He comes from Homa and Makaunga in Tonga. My mother's Anne Lynch from the family's been here since the 1800s kind of time, so um, we are well established in Aotearoa. Uh, my journey's been, I uh, grew up in, in Mangere and went to um, Elam School of Fine Arts in the 90s and studied under um, its Toiho department with, with um, Sal Muru and Brett Graham. Um, learned a lot from those guys, especially in, in regards to um, uh, Maori values and Fight, uh, fight for sovereignty, for self sovereignty. Um, from there, I went to teachers' college. Tried my hand at teaching high school students, but it, um, it wasn't me at the time. It's probably, I was only about 25, so it was, I wasn't that much older than that. Um, and then came to architecture school. Did that. Had a family. Um, been working since. Um, a bit more design in Pano. I've worked on the Tonga Parliament. Wanamani and I was working in Fiji for two years, um, just helping out over there. Um, but yeah, really privileged to be here and with such um, distinguished um, people as well to be with. Yeah, i Ole Pasifika, ole Fale Au Au Hoktu, Ote Olo Ngoa, Ole Lifano, Ole Pati Living in Stone and Refiti, Ote Alo Alo Malo Papao in Aota in Ai, Le Wananga o Aronu o Kamaki, o Kaurau. Yeah, Ote Saumai Saamoa, Ote Lutato Nei, 
oleh nuwu te sa u ola ma u lofu mai ai fas ke uta ya a leu te matai mai le nuwu le wa mai mai si fo i la la o o le a nuwu se ba i ma ma pia mai si me a o na fo i ma wai o fo a o ma to ai nga um ya o te o a o le ai a o nga i le le nei o fai fale po se on ve fainga ia ma fa fai fa ma ho fa o o ai kia mo me fa pe nai i ka ko i i le mo na nui um per to ke to you know what i said uh my name is Albert Rafiti i have a a uh, uh, when i'm in this house uh, especially mm. in, in the uh, uh presence of many samoans I have I, t- I carry a ancestral title uh, Lili Fano from Bawai where my grandfather the title that my grandfather had but I was raised in the village of Fasto Uta uh, and I come over from across the road I read my papa my little canoe from across the road at uh, Wananga o Arunui o Aotearoa uh, sorry o Tamaki Mahaura um, yeah um, here and thank you for hosting this tonight to uh, wonderful colleagues here of Taylor. Tatua Huruiki Manga, Tuiti Ao, Tuiti Po, Kongati Ho, Kyota, Kongati, Tati Waiki Tai, Atena Koto Katua. So I come from Whangarei and Whangaruru harbour and um, came down to university here and studied here in the 80s uh, with Dr. Mike Austin who's in, in the house, Ngamihi Nui Kia Kwe Mike and I was in the same year as Albert Rafiti here um, so there's so many different layers of con- connection to the people in the room and also to this particular place uh, which um, I was lucky to be a student when we opened um, Waipapa Marae and to be uh, living with carvers at the time, two of the carvers who were working on, on the on the whare and um, and to be part of the, the, the Ropu Tawira that uh, were, were opening the um, opening the complex and uh, Meri Penfold had written this uh, Pātere was about 45 lines long so a lot of the Tawira had them taped to the back of their shirt so you just get behind us <laughs> That's the only way we want to get through that pātere. Um, so, um, pleased to be here today. I, I work variously um, in uh, academia with Unitech um, and with Design Tribe Architects and in research, um, working with Albert at the moment and um, really privileged to uh, be deepening my appreciation of uh, Moa Nanui um, culture and traditions r- in relation to tohunga whare. Uh, particularly in Tahiti Nui, uh, in Samoa and in Hawaii. And so uh, being able to get to some of those places and, uh, and um, in particular sit with some of those remnant uh, tufunga um, is, a, is a real privilege and um, certainly reminds me of how in the uh, 70s and 80s when you were ed- being educated in Aotearoa, uh, you were, your, the education system separated you from your Moana Nui cousins uh, they were other, um, and uh, it's only with this uh, re-education process that we realise how close we are in terms of our uh, whakapapa, our waka traditions, our uh, reo, and um, also our, our architecture. So, pleased to be here to support this paper. Kia ora. Kia ora. Ya pukul wawai wawai ya mukul wawai E tariki Wai le toa Hane toa Kyo rana Ki rana koto kaputu e te arwa mana e te tsua Ki rana koto kaputu e te ne rama nea Iroto e te ne are Irunga Ya tatau are wana nga O vai pukatau matarau Kyo rana La kyo rana Ki rana koto kaputu a O te ne kaba E tsui tsui ia tatau Tsui tsui ia Iroto e takapapa Tu tu ia, iroto i te enua, i te kāinga, i te papa, i te rangi. 
次は
Indigenous Design Director of WSP, and Tongan Architect Andrew Dunukwafe, and Executive and Chair of the Warren and Mani Board. Their talks reminded us how different but complementary our Mana Moana musicians are along the journey towards placement in Aotearoa. Dr. Ra said, too fast, slow down. We, Tangata Whenua, need time to work through it all. But we need design allies to make space, to make room for Māori design authority within our industry. Dunamuafe shared design ideas about what can be, what can we collaborate and embed into, uh, from our ancestral links of Moana and Kiwa within architecture. In our second lecture by Professor Paul Mehmet and Professor Alison Page from Te Aumaria, Australia, they said, first, understand country with a capital C before attempting to design on and with country. Understand country through song lines, through dreamtime stories, and knowing who country is. So I'm giving you a very short version, by the way, so please go check it out, it's all online. Thanks to Div, our sponsors. Next slide. So tonight, we continue the theme of Manamana, which acknowledges the ancestral connections across this great Pacific Ocean that connects us all, stitching together our sameness, our connectedness, which gives us all the fun. We are very honoured to have Aotearoa's top experts speaking to, to these spaces and places and ideas, our panelists. And um, we want to just say, say thank you again. Thank you for your mana and your ego. So we continue with ideas about indigenising places, indigenising design thinking, and going deep into time and space to understand our lines of connection and perhaps disconnection when designing in and for Aotearoa. The mana of the whenua, the mana of the moana. What happens when they touch, feel, overlap? Are they distorted, harmonious, unstable, conflicting? Can the vast or our ancestral relations be our momentum forward? Tonight, Lama and I want this to be a safe place, a safe space for our panelists, our audience. Um, we acknowledge that the topics are culturally sensitive. And this is a platform to speak about such issues openly and safely, to improve and strengthen our mahi as architects and designers in Aotearoa. Mama wanted to share a proverb about our mahi. We didn't want it to be, to be too perfect, so we deliberately knocked the paper down. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, as Charmaine has mentioned, we're starting to get into the crux of tonight. But I just want to second also a welcome. Um, it's really important um, that we acknowledge these processes of the poor fitty and the other. And also, to be blessed and have it in such a structure, I think it's extremely important. There's a common saying in our, in our culture, and I'm sure that's, they're very similar cultures throughout. That translates to, if there is no language, there is no culture. If there is no culture, the village is in darkness. Now, <coughs> Recent explorations around the student briefs here at our School of Architecture, we've explored these themes in terms of trying to revive and trying to go back to the funny in terms of the Samoan brief that we're looking at. Why? Because we're starting to lose our language. 
and process like the pore feeding and the other rejuvenates them. And I've got my 13 year old son here that I actually forced him to come. He's on holiday and he thinks that he should be left alone to play on Xbox. You know. you, today you're going to learn something about our culture today and many other cultures here that are present. So without further ado, um, I just want to welcome um, Associate Professor Mike uh, Davis, who I've been trying <laughs> to dig up his papa because he's got links to Samoa. And they're not very small links. He's actually tied to the kings of Samoa, Maria Tua titles. So I've actually called him Laomi, which is the very well-known uh, son of Maria Tua in Samoa. And so we're very, very privileged, well, I'm very pri privileged to have him here because he's also trying to get in touch with his, this side of this culture as well. showing up for us year on year, they support us kind of endlessly, this series in particular, but there are a lot of other things around the school and we're, we're very, very grateful for their ongoing support. I don't know, Black, I met a few years ago. Is he here? I don't know, are you here? Is there anyone from Japan? Oh, we must him. Shall we? Um, anyway, they were going to... Thank you, thank you, Jim. Um, are we able to run the, run the video? So words from our sponsor? Thanks, Al. Thanks, everybody. Our new Tauranga facility is now operational, manufacturing and distributing jib plasterboard across the nation. The size of eight rugby fields, with 50% more capacity than the Auckland plant, and the ability for further expansion. Designed with our commitment to safety, quality, sustainability, and innovation. We will always be on board with you.
please help us out to the refreshments as we rearrange the panel discussion. So don't go away, come back. It's only in the stand, um, Vince is eating too. So I have requested that the food and the drinks be left open just so that you guys can make your way up there and get some more food if you wish. What's the thing You love it. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, or rather wave coming around the other side. <laughs> and it's only for a little while, because as you navigate through that storm, there's going to be some clear water on the other side. But we've got to go through the storm to get through to the other side. So without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Michelle. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the proverb about the walker. Um, this is a warmer, right? So, can our panelists kind of remind us of your cultural design role within your practice, within your firm, and in one word, define what is place making in Aotearoa? Hard one. And so, sorry, you've got a microphone there. If we could begin. Yeah, I'm ready, don't I? Yes. <laughs> is there like, oh, is that on? Yep. Great. So is there like a longer answer and then the one word? Or am I trying to answer everything to one word because I don't know if that's... As you wish. Okay, cool. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> go closer. Yeah, getting coaching. How's this, everybody? Great. Great. Um, in my firm, so I started my company, so I was everything and now I get to be what I what everyone tells me I need to be, and sometimes things that I want to do. Um, but in terms of cultural design, a lot of the time we work directly with Marae and Bokainga, or, and sometimes iwi as clients, and so it's really down to helping them articulate their cultural values in the way that they want to in terms of the built environment, whether it's buildings or landscape, or whatever. And then the more tricky role that we keep saying yes to is on major kind of civic and commercial projects where we're there at the behest of our hapu, but it's a government project and there's always a sort of tension line because the government client might have certain aims, your hapu have got certain aims, you're probably working with another architect, they've got certain aims and values and that's a bit of a tension. But I guess we keep showing up because our hapu ask us to be there in those spaces and I think it was spoken to really well um, at the beginning and especially in um, Dari's quarter, or it's really about we want to see our identity in the environment reflected in a meaningful way. Um, and I always, this is, I won't keep it, I'll keep it kind of short, but um, something I always think about whenever we do this work of reinscribing our cultural narratives into the environment is that I want our young people to see themselves, mm. see themselves located. And to me, they're always the primary audience and, you know, it keeps reading out from there through to visitors and you know everyone's going to get different layers of meaning but I think for our own young people who are residing within the Erohe or within Aotearoa I want them to see their, themselves in their environment and that can be the touchstone to discovering more deeper knowledge of their identity and their whakapapa and those pirako that lead to place um, and my word is whakapapa mm. Thank you Jane <coughs> Okay, this is better Cool. Um, okay, my role has changed quite a lot over the years, but um, a lot of it is similar to what Jay is describing. I find I'm often the middle point between clients and, and mana whenua, uh, iwi, hapu, Māori and their aspirations, and you're often trying to broker a conversation um, to get better outcomes for everybody. But ultimately, to be able to get our tamariki to see themselves, 100%, I agree with that. Um, as the years have gone by, I've become less and less interested in calling myself an architect, so to speak, because I find I do more talking and storytelling, um, and that all the other parts that I do in my world, making art, singing, this kind of mahi, um, the sort of wider field of architecture, um, for want of a better, of a better term, has become the place I tend to reside. So I've sort of made a role that fits what I'm interested in to help our people to the best of my ability. Um, so that's a really bad way of describing my job description, um, which has never fit on a piece of paper anyway. Um, my response to your question about the one word is I'm actually gonna challenge the term placemaking. Um, it's come about, I think, in a, quite an interesting Pākehā or Eurocentric um, sort of lens where we as humans think we make place. Um, the term I like to use is being place made. Um, it came up in a conversation we were actually having um, in Toronto a few years ago. A lot of the indigenous uh, whānau over there were talking about how they felt like um, a lot of, they don't say Pākehā, but a lot of Pākehā were coming in and making place for them, like look at this beautiful place we've made. Um, and they were sort of like, place makes us. 
Um, we are made by our environment. We um, are a reflection of their stories. So I prefer to think about being place made than being place makers. It doesn't answer your question, but that is my word. Okay, thank place you. Made. So, Papa, Papa, place made. Um, yes, so my role uh, is, well, back in 2017, 16, 17, we started uh, Mouse Studios. So there were four of us architecture graduates um, from Unitech as well as down at Victoria University. So my, my role at the moment, so that's been six, six years, I think we turned six this year. Six, five, six, one or two. Six. Six, thank you very much. Um, and we're working across a few different projects and mostly inside the housing space and seeing the need from our families, particularly our Maori Pacifica families in Aotearoa. And family, well, the, the funding or our homes are our anchor place and what grounds us to place. Um, so my role really is kind of sitting across a number of different places uh, from business development to uh, really building the capability and capacity of our, our team. Uh, we're a relatively young team, most of them being here right now. Most of them probably don't like me right now, but that's okay. Um, no, it's not okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, we're a, a young team, we're a maturing team, and we're a developing team, but it's the process that we're committed to in order to meet the outcomes that our families really need in Aotearoa. Uh, and so, I, my, so that was the, the word that interprets placemaking to us, right? So, I believe a, a fundamental part of our process is really being about celebrating the concept of mau, or mo uh, in one and more communities. And so, mo or mo is a, a pan-Pacific or one and more term, which means to uh, to be steadfast or to hold firmly on to by looking at it philosophically well, and also acknowledging the, the many um, the Mao movements or Mao historically into modern way of a bit of a history lesson but uh, over in Samoa Le Mao or the Mao Samoa commonly known as was a movement which uh, resisted colonization uh, from Germany and Brit uh, New Zealand administration in Samoa in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, Mao for them was their opposition. So Mao meant their, um, their stance or their viewpoints or uh, their commitment. And they were resistant against uh, the forces which were trying to overthrow their cultural customs and their values and their beliefs. And ultimately that led to the independence of Samoa in 1962. And correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the first one of the nations to be independent from colonization in the mid 1900s. Uh, there was Mao Piolu, who was you know, quite influential in the re reviving uh, one of the voyaging, which a lot of us string or well, attach our identity to today, very important part. And then there's Kiamo from Tinanata and, uh, and reclaiming our stories of identity and reclamation and resistance of imperialism and things like that. So. Um, we didn't know a lot of this back, you know, six, seven years ago, but now today I believe, for me, placemaking is, um, is Mao or Mo, and for us, Mo or Mao is about understanding our place in the world uh, and understanding our role in being able to regenerate the values or the beliefs, but also just to be able to support <coughs> our families and our communities to see what they want to see uh, in their Tūranga Waiwai or their place and their strongest sense of belonging. So, yeah, I'll speak a little bit more to that later on, but for me, the word is mum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm working at um, Mode, um, which is mainly in, it's an Australian company and it has one office in New Zealand. Um, our office in New Zealand has is made up of uh, staff who are from all over the world. So I'm kind of the... Um, cultural champion of the office, so if they, if they don't know a word or something, they're like, Maori, what's this mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of that, um, so, so we uh, work a lot in corrections, correction facilities, um, and there's a new push to engage with communities a lot more. Um, and so a lot of our work, we have to work with um, cultural advisors or facilitators who are usually 
um, from certain iwi um, where projects can study. So my role is kind of, kind of to interface with these guys and um, and be able to filter and um, process knowledge and information between um, to the to the company and you know to these um, uh, facilitators who who are then um, communicating with the community. So it's um, trying to enable that um, voice to come through to, through the design. Um, it's not always e easy. Um, I've, I've tried to um, increase the cultural competency of the firm, um, but that's sort of work in progress, I guess. Um, the word placemaking. I, I walked through Elam um, just last week, I had time to kill, and I haven't been there for like 20 years. <coughs> and there was some po that stand there that have been carved, and we did that in our um, second year. Um, and what it made me think was just of all the um, people that I shared at that time. So I think um, I think offer love is the is the binding is the binding um, element which because because places are about people and it's about memories of people and, and these sorts of things. So for me, that's that's what it is. Thank you, Mike. Just a recap. So the place made resistance self-determination and offer love. Kia ora, um, uh, We established the Sign Tribe in 1994 <coughs> and we were four, four years out of uh, architecture school and we um, thought we had rattled around enough in, in various roles and offices and uh, building and so on and, and came together as a a collective and um, the kaupapa then and, and is still now to try and make uh, architectural expertise available to communities that who don't normally have access to that expertise. <coughs> and um, so my role has kind of moved a lot in the, in the last nearly 30 years and um, a, lot, a lot of the time now we're working on larger projects and I'm my main role is to connect the, uh, securely connect the mana whenua groups to the design process mm -hmm. and to be part of the cultural design responses uh, for those, for those uh, individuals who represent their hapu and, and their iwi and their runaka in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, another one of my roles that sort of front of mind right now is um, we just today uh, finished our first wānanga for uh, the inaugural Manakaiinga uh, curriculum course which is a Māori housing leadership program and so we've just got our first 15 um, uh, tauira on board and uh, launched the um, kaupapa on um, Monday night in the last two days we've been taking them around Orake um, to Otahu, uh, to Papiringa, to uh, Mahurure Marae, to uh, Papakura Marae, and to Co House in Grayland. And um, I guess uh, the name of that course is Manakaina. And, um, and that, the, that is really about. Um, remembering the utmost significance of, of kāinga in, uh, in everything that we do. Uh, so if we are securely connected to place and to the people of that place, then, then we will be well. So the, the name that I've been thinking about just since um, you posed that question is Oranga Tōnitara, which is really talk to that um, long-standing well-being. Mm -hmm. um, in the name Ora, of course, is a is a well um, entrenched in our Moana Nui realm, and um, I think it's uh, at its heart is, is what we all aspire to through the field of, uh, of architecture. And uh, I'm picking up on uh, Elizabeth's commentary around terminology. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's really important, and I think that. Um, <clears throat> time has come to, for us to reclaim and reclaim the, the terms that are used in Aotearoa, um, a, a term that we particularly resisted in the 
early 2000s was urban design. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the whole um, Te Aranga uh, push in, from 2005, 6 uh, onwards was around um, re retaking control over the, of, some, of some terminology. So the, the name that we came up with at that time in English was uh, cultural landscapes. Because when you use the term cultural landscapes, there are people in your mind. Mm. When you use the term urban design, there may be buildings, there may be hard surfaces, uh, there may be modified environments, but then but the, what does not come to mind is actually people. Mm. Um, so I think it's really important that we, um, in, uh, in these conversations, to um, come together and wānanga terminology, mm. Um, whatever else is appropriate and um, he, at least here in Aotearoa push back when appropriate against terms which, which we think are actually recolonising us. So, um, Koina, kia ora. Thank you. I'm Martha. Whoa, um, Albert. <laughs> what, what did I do? Uh, when I finished architecture school, same time as Rao, I worked in architecture, so I used to be a working architect for Lane Priest, No Lane and Richard Priest, and then I went overseas and worked for Fiery Heron, and mainly, most of the project when I was working was mainly in the art, museum, art gallery, uh, houses or studios for artists, so I kind of fell into that world. And when I came back to New Zealand, I uh, did the same thing with the, for the museum for a number of years. And then I uh, decided to become an academic because I had started some studies in London when I was there. Um, kind of lazy. I didn't, I, didn't have the <laughs> I didn't have the attention that some people have about architecture. <laughs> So I went back to my books and I love, I, I love archives, reading and stuff like that. So my current job is uh, I'm the convener for the Vamoana Research Cluster at AUT, School of Art and Design. And uh, it's been going for around 10 years, uh, 2002 to, uh, 2012, sorry, 2013. Um, we, first, one of the first thing that got me interested in the current work that I do is that this building, I worked on this building in 2002-2003 and previously to that I did some field work in Samoa and predominantly Albert Wheat gave me a grant to go there and I wasn't interested in Samoan architecture because I, I lived and grew up there and yeah okay, their buildings, they never changed. But what's interesting is why they never changed. So that got me thinking about, because all our training at architecture school is all about invention of new forms and new the novel. How come these kind of forms, although you know, it's built in New Zealand and all the things are wrong about it, as I can see, but somehow the cohesiveness of the thing stays the same. Got me interested about this thing called VAR, so some of you are familiar with the notion of VAR. So it's not so much the artifact or the the, the um, the apparatus that hold us together in space. It's the thing that happens in here, the rituals, the ceremonies, mm. the designated uh, sitting position of people and the hierarchy that goes on. So for uh, maybe five or six years we've been doing this uh, research on VAR, which is coming to the end of this year. And the current research that I'm returning back now, now I have a good handle on why, why architecture emerges in the Pacific, is now I'm working with Ro on this uh, master-funded project on artefacts of relations. And now when I and Ro and a number of other researchers from Hawaii and Tahiti and here in Aotearoa, we're looking at then the artefact. Why, if VA, this uh, social system that we have is important, uh, in Farinui, in most of our uh, places of worship, in, in cathedral, you can apply the same kind of logic. Why the artifact then? What is the relationship between those ritual and social system that gave rise to those things and the artifact, the architecture, the ornamentation, 
and of course uh, what happens to all that uh, with the advent of technology and capitalism and so forth. So that's kind of well what I, what I do. The word, one word, quickly, uh, probably uh, about placemaking is friendship, really. I mean, mm. I wasn't born here, so I don't, you know, I don't feel like I can just make place. But all the uh, relationships that I've had with Tangata Whenua here and other migrants and other Kiwis, it's all about friendship and in some sense gives me the sense that I find a place or I can talk about things safely. You know, a wonderful friendship with people from Tuhoi because of people I've known there. And it's probably the, the uh, uh, Tangata Whenua that I feel closer to, but also just in the last 15 years with uh, 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 Ngati Whātua Ōraki, uh, some wonderful friendships there. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's got a or hōtanga or sotanga in Samoa. I think that, that for me as a, as a migrant it has to be the, the reason why I find there is an authenticity about place. Otherwise, yeah, I'm just a, a migrant. And a, and a, well, oh, thank you for opening mm -hmm. our discussion, Valinor, with your ideas of placemaking. Uh, noted, we need to use our own real mm -hmm. uh, languages to uh, work on those terminologies. So, friendship, long standing well being, I love that, of people. Wonderful. Thank you. Look, we've got a number of questions, but we may. Um, it down from four to two. Let's see how we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a long time to introduce. Right? Some have said that New Zealand's emphasis on biculturalism since 1840 has dimmed down the ancestral connections between my Pacific peoples to focus more on the New Zealand nation state. Maori scholar Alistair Puma Somerville likens this historical and deep relationship of Māori and Pacific peoples to an underwater volcano, whereby the tip is what we know of Māori, but its connections to the Pacific are obscured. However, recent works, mostly by Indigenous researchers, have shifted our attention to understanding deep time and space beyond the colonial project. Like the writings of the late Evelyn Hawafa, who says the Moana Pacific Ocean has always been our lines of connection. Recent documentaries by Scotty Morrison, titled Origins. Who's watched that? I think most of you, right? Exactly. Again, reaffirms our deep connections across Moana and Luikiwa and all the way here to Aotearoa. And thank you, Rowan and Albert, for sharing some of the project you're working on, which I know is aligned with this thinking. I'd love to hear more, I'm sure everyone else too. So, considering all of this, our first question is, what is your position in relation to the Titiriti of Waitangi, Treaty of Waitangi, whichever version you describe to, and how does that position inform how you practice? I'd like to begin with uh, our session professor Albert. Oh, who has the mic? Come on. Who has the mic? We were passing it to the uncles, either side, we didn't care who. You can take two. I think we'll see in the last year there was actually a uh, symposium here, and I saw about that funny, and the first question was some part yet. You're a phenomenal, and I would say, what is your, uh, you know, position on mortality, <laughs> companion reason? Um, and I, you know, it I took me some by surprise because I thought I, I'd organise it in my head. But I, I think, you know, uh, one of the really important thing, the, the only way I can say uh, I can have a position on the treaty is, is, is as an indigenous person. What would be an, uh, as an indigenous person to my indigenous people of the country here? 
uh, what would my position is to them? And I said to Pania, my position is that I would not feel ease as an Indigenous person unless your land is all returned to you or the Indigenous people of the country should get their what, what it is the, the thing that they belong to because I come from a country where we say well, our land, we, we have titles that fix the land. So yeah, and my, my, my position is really one from an Indigenous perspective that I would not feel uh, at ease as an Indigenous person if the Indigenous people here in Aotearoa don't get their land back. Mm. I would not feel, yeah, I, I still feel uneasy being an Indigenous person in the world, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. It's one of those projects that, um, anyway, that I keep thinking about. Mm. It's quite a personal one. Mm. Mm. has that mm. mic. Since Rose holding the mic. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Albert. And, uh, you know, I think um, it's, uh, it's really important um, that um, we put ourselves in our, uh, the position of the other. And if we have been born and raised in a, an Indigenous culture, where your your where your rangatiratanga is undisputed, it's it's much easier to put yourself in that position and then and then speak to that in another another land. Yeah. The um, my tupuna um, argued vociferously for the signing of Tatiriti or Waitangi, and uh, on the fifth of February eighteen forty, they were in a six-hour debate at Waitangi, uh, and we're lucky that the uh, that debate was actually recorded, uh, was uh, transcribed at the time. So we effectively know what was said and by whom. And um, our tūpuna at the time said, look, we've come too far um, with our relationships with uh, Tauiwi, with Pākehā, and we now need to um, ensure that the 2,000 British subjects that are here are kept in order and that Queen Victoria fulfills her role as, in terms of looking after them and, and often their lawlessness. So um, I come from a, a whānau who were uh, pro-treaty um, and then of course we all know the history since the signing of Tatiriti. Um, in 2014, uh, Ngāpuhi uh, took uh, the, one of the first claims that we had was the sovereignty claim, and uh, that claim was effectively going to the heart of Te Tiriti of Waitangi, uh, and, and Ngāpuhi saying, well, we, we did not sign over sovereignty uh, to, uh, to the, the Queen or the Crown, and uh, furthermore, we couldn't do that. You can't sign over the sovereignty of, of your nation, your children's, your grandchildren's nation to another power. So it's, not, it's not in your power to actually do that. Um, so the, the tribunal um, came back in 2014 and actually, um, based on their research, uh, agreed that the chiefs uh, who signed to Tiriti of Waitangi in at Waitangi uh, did not seek sovereignty. Um, and of course that uh, mic drop um, has has kind of um, kind of been uh, totally forgotten by successive governments since that time because it's just too fundamental uh, to the way that our structures have been developed to for for any government since to actually um, comprehend what it really means. Um, not with, notwithstanding that, we have a settlement process uh, in Ngāpuhi, which is finally um, finally beginning to move ahead at a hapu level. Uh, so we, will get a, we, we are getting groupings of hapu uh, coming together um, to, uh, to begin that settlement process. So I guess it's a very personal to me, um, and I guess it's driven my um, push when I was studying at the School of Architecture. I was uh, very disillusioned with the, uh, the content of the course, except for um, 
people like Mike Austin um, of the theory disillusioned and um, began to agitate for uh, changes to the way that architecture was taught mm. in, in Aotearoa. And um, that's pushed me into uh, uh, teaching uh, roles at uh, Auckland University initially and then at UniTech to try and um, improve the uh, standard of uh, education so that we can um, create better architects uh, who, are, who hold um, solid knowledge of, of whakapapa, uh, of pūrāko, of mana whenua, um, and, and who can be allies. As has, mentioned, as has been mentioned, and who can be part of our, our move to progressively reclaim uh, our, our cultural landscapes. So, Kilda. Thank you. Would any of our other four panelists like to Was that you keeping up for the way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I come back to the corridor, uh, uh, Albert. Um, I think that's a really important point and I'm so glad we started with that. Uh, I actually really got way too many things to do and say, so I need to kind of simmer down my thoughts because I really was interested in your first provocation before the question. Um, I grew up in Australia, which is, I think, a bit of a different positionality and experience, um, and I know there's others in the room who are Māori grew up in Australia. <laughs> um, and, you know, in my experience at that time, and I know we've kind of moved past, you know, like things like Polynesian as an outdated term, but when I was growing up, that's really how I identified. Mm. Because there was all hardly any Māori that weren't my own whānau. And so it was like, there were Samoans, there was Tongans, people from Niue, and also the indigenous people um, of the area that we lived in. You know, so we felt a real collectivity and solidarity with each other. And so to me, that was really normal. But then when I moved to Aotearoa as a young person and also actually just coming back here when I was, you know, a kid and a teenager, I actually saw, is it racism, lateral violence? I saw that and even in my own family and some of our old people who I love dearly, but some of those aunties who were like, you know, they're different to us and, mm. and, and carrying those outdated attitudes. Mm. And I found that confronting, sad, not quite sure how to reconcile that in myself uh, I can understand where that thinking comes from because we've had social policies thrust upon yeah. us that create that division. But I, as Australia has many problems. But I did grow up at least with that benefit of thinking of us as whanaunga and, and not seeing that division mm. until I came to Aotearoa and really could see it. Yeah. Um, the next follow through on that story is that um, I've recently been sort of exploring a bit more in, in the Pacific um, and we went to Rarotonga, um, my partner and I, and we also took a class online for like six months, learning a bit of the um, Rarotongan reo. And that was just such an eye-opening experience for me, and also other trips I've taken to Hawaii and so on, because it really reframed what is Māori. Mm. And I met Māori from Rarotonga and Moke and, you know, parts of Tahiti, and mm. they had their own reo, and some of their reo was very similar to ours. Mm. And so it kind of decentered us as Māori of Aotearoa and go, actually, there's a whole bunch of us, and we're really, really connected. And I think that if we haven't, and, you know, I get it, I'm educated, I'm pretty privileged at this point in my life and it didn't start that way I've got the ability to go to these places and make these connections mm. that me as a young person like just completely ignorant I wouldn't have known all of this stuff except that you know we're in Australia and there, there were other people from you know other young people from the Pacific and we felt we could relate to each other um, yeah so I guess what am I trying to say I think that these divisions are ones of colonization and political making that we feel very deeply here in Aotearoa Australia has different problems, but I think we can see our connectivity across the Pacific. And then the more that we're able to break down those barriers um, and find our connections back to each other with events like this and some of the really cool trips across the Pacific, some of us have been privileged to go on. I, I think the better that we are to understand ourselves in that way. And then the last point I'll make, because I know this answer is so long, is that uh, the treaty thing, it's actually quite tricky because I think, you know, our whanaunga across the Pacific are always our, our whanaunga and weren't envisioned differently. That agreement has a really specific relationship with the colonial power mm -hmm. and I don't think we should forget that. So I, I hear people talking about things like, you know, where do Tauiwi sit, where do Tangata Moana sit in relation mm -hmm. to the treaty. If you're not Tangata Whenua, you must be Tangata Tiriti, which I'm not sure I agree with. 
and I, I don't have the answers, but given that that's what's structuring our country that's still under a colonial power, mm. I think within our communities we need to have those wānanga. Mm. And so, I mean, I guess this is just one talanoi and one space, but these kind of conversations I think are really beneficial. And I'm thinking also of the work that Asian supporting Tinoranga Teratanga have led mm. to caucus and work through these issues in our specific groups and come together. I can't think just more of that. Um, and I'll leave it there. Yeah. Okay, you can go. Right, I'll you. Um, yes, I have lots of thoughts running through my mind as well. So structuring them might be challenging. Um, I suppose I've been fortunate, I guess, funnily enough, through my career to explore a lot of these conversations and discussions. It's the privilege that I, I guess Jay's talking about that has actually recontextualised as well a very personal experience of my upbringing, being that mothers. You know, so I'm one to learn and dad is Māori. Um, and I grew up with, this is a very personal story, but I grew up with dad actively talking about how he used to fight the Samoans in um, Whanarei. Um, him and his brothers used to go and beat them up. I don't know why, but they did. Um, and it's this sort of old rhetoric that dad used to have that he kind of thought was funny, but it was around that, um, that period in the 70s, 60s, 70s, where Māori and Pacifica peoples who had come to Aotearoa in large numbers mm. were all fighting for those labour jobs. Mm. Um, I know that's not where the division started, but I know that in my dad's mind it was he either got a job or the other guy got the job. Um, and there were these sort of falsities uh, of, of separation um, in, in our communities. And then dad married a Samoan woman. Like, it made no sense in my mind as a kid. I couldn't understand why he was sort of, why he found those stories so funny. And then he married a Samoan woman and his entire whanau was Samoan. And he was just like, yeah, this is great. You know, anyway, confusing. Um, so I remember having that in my mind and being quite confused actually as a kid because I would hear my nana speaking to her siblings and lots of the words sounded like te reo Māori um, and I couldn't quite understand, like I just, I can never contextualise this idea of difference when you seem to be way more in common than there was different. Um, and then also just as a kid, you know, knowing that we were talking about our waka and our pepeha and that our waka came from this, you know, magical place called Hawaii and oh, Hawaii, Hawaii and then you grow up and you realise where Hawaii is, it's all through Te Moana Nui Akiwa. You know, so it's just, this is a bit of a, a, a baby story, I guess, just, just sort of talking to that personal aspect of, it's taken me a long time in my head to get to a place of realising the sheer level of connectivity and in particular the last two years of my life working on projects like the Whale Malaya with, um, with Albert, trying to create this idea of a pan-Pacific whale, which pan-Pacific architecture doesn't exist, we know that. But thinking about, um, you know, the, the strength or the power of our connectivity and where some of these stories come from and how you might um, create an architecture that could potentially represent all of us. And, and as Albert has said, it's actually largely come back to the ways we might codify the building through art or we might think about the types of ritual or ceremony that would occur inside of the building that would in fact make the building of all of Te Moana Akiwa, not from one island or another. My own research in a project that I very tentatively going to talk about where I'm going to exhibit in Venice next year um, in the ocean space um, uh, exhibition space that will open as a part of the Venus Biennale, Jeepers Creepers, anyway. Um, and that project is also looking to connect through story um, our relationship back to each other. Yeah. So again, when I was in Hawaii with um, actually <laughs> most of us here, this crew and you fellas, um, singing karaoke with our friends, um, I remember being at a uh, hayao with Lily Kala and she was doing a uli out to the moana and I had this moment of going, holy shit, I can see the other side of the ocean. Mm. I felt like I had a more holistic view 
of where I sat. And like Jade was saying, my Māoriness got quite decentered, and I liked that. I, I finally felt a sense of being from this body that was so expansive that I hadn't quite experienced before. So the work that I'm producing for Ocean Space without giving anything away will be trying to bring our real and our ideas of, of the ocean as a body back to witness um, so that we can celebrate her and her fullness. And I will talk about it as a her in that instance because I'm relating back to a particular pūrāko that I've heard about in terms of Wainui Atea, which was an atua that was with Ranginui before Ranginui was with Papa Tuanuku, uh, who was the ocean body who split herself apart to allow Papa Tuanuku to come up through. Um, so this is when the ocean was a singular body. Um, so I guess, again, long-winded answer, but through the beauty of the things I get to research in this, I've been able to stitch together back my understanding of who I am, and it has to be personal first, so that I can actually do the work with our communities to help stitch <coughs> ourselves back together, because it's an absolute falsity that we're different. Mm. Um, Yeah, I just like, just want to acknowledge the Taranoa Korero at the moment and the rain. And I, I'm going to admit that when I saw this as the first question, part of this uh, panel was, was quite a, a strong tension um, and a healthy tension and a good tension because it's ongoing conversations that we have at the office, but it's ongoing conversations that I have in my head. And it's ongoing conversations that I have with my partner who is um, Māori and quite tutu in, in her own ways of being, but also being quite immersed with inside a hapu and a pukanga myself. And like there's ongoing conversations and dialogues with myself every single day as a Samoan male standing in, in the marae, <laughs> standing in the pukanga, everyone's standing and having kōrero and I'm just kind of sitting there and just, you know, it's a constant navigation and it's a daily navigation of who I am and what is my position with inside Aotearoa, or more specifically, what is my position with inside my family in the setting of a pukainga, in the setting of a hapu, in the setting of an iwi, particularly who has not gone through their titiriti um, settlement process. So, but it's all, I'm also, and I, I understand it's quite a privileged space, but if I'm speaking from a Pacifica perspective, which I think is a healthy conversation for many Pacifica to have, and this is a conversation that I had with my partner recently leading up to this, because I think this is the question that I was most nervous about, was how do we have this conversation, particularly for Pacifica or Samoan, Mao, uh, uh, Tongan, Niuean, and our positioning of ourselves with inside Aotearoa, because I look at it from a number of perspectives, and I don't know why my head works like that, but my head works like that, compartmentalizes perspectives. I think from a cultural perspective, from a conversation around Titiriti, is naturally for us as people from Wananui or f as a Samoan, is that you're always acknowledging the Ramatira of or the, or the people of place. And for us as Samoans and Pacifica people being here in Aotearoa just makes sense and it's a cultural worldview which I cannot separate from my life that Māori do hold their tino rangatira tanga and mana mutuhake here. Which I believe from a, what that's titiriti at its essence is, is trying to stipulate that, is trying to reaffirm that from paper value. And as I just want to acknowledge too what Ro had said around, well that was the initial intention, but now almost 150 years after that hasn't been the case. Mm -hmm. It's 150 years. My okay. math is horrible today. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And so, in the conversations with my partner uh, around this was, from a professional perspective, right, from looking at it from that, from that angle was, it's just, it's quite hard to, quite hard to look at titiriti as a statement, as a policy, and how do I integrate that into our business development and into the infrastructure of our company when we are all Māori, we are all Pacifica, and this is how we, this is how we naturally live and see the world in the first place. And we acknowledge the tino rangatira tanga and mana mutuhaki of tangata whenua, like wherever we go in Aotearoa. And to try 
force that with inside a business infrastructure of policies and statements and things like that just seems so unnatural, completely unnatural, which gets to a point where we don't, we don't think that's probably the most valuable way of doing that. Um, and then it's also from both that cultural and professional perspective is where the tension lies. And I believe this is where tension for a lot of us Pacifica and people see our positioning in Titiriti. So I think the most constructive thing that came out of a conversation with my partner was, well, how do you take thousands of years of relationality and understanding of our worldviews and the sense of collectivism across Timor and Muyakiwa, and how do we articulate that now in today's context in Aotearoa? Because for a very long time, and just acknowledging what both Peter and um, Jade have mentioned was, you know, over the last five decades, there's been a like, there's been an absolute disconnection from a policy-making perspective, from a social perspective, cultural perspective. But it's only largely here in Aotearoa, and and that's no no fault of of anyone in this room. Can sit here and talk about the government, but I don't think that's constructive. Anyway, where I was getting to was it feels like we're at a time now where we can start developing what those frameworks and processes look like from a cultural perspective mm -hmm. between Tangata Fenua and Tangata Moana, Moana Pacifica, and how that then translates across the, the wider architectural industry. For us, we can control that and we can influence that. And if anything, we can be somewhat of a leader across other industries across Aotearoa. And what does that relationality look like from a professional perspective, which uplifts and fakamana our our cultural worldviews, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I think it's at the time we're at a healthy time, and we're at a very privileged time to do that. And I don't, I don't think we should miss out on this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a, um, I'm like I said, I, was, I saw that question, I was like, oh man, I don't know how to answer this one. Um, but I, I, thought, I thought about my, um, my kids' grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Um, who will they identify with if they stay here? Um, their ties with Tonga, for example, will slowly get weaker and weaker as, you know, the, suddenly they've got fourth or fifth cousins. Um, it becomes different. And it's like, um, what system would I think they should grow up with in? And I think that um, the indigenous systems are, are a lot more resilient and testable time for, the, for their safety, for their mm -hmm. to grow up in. Um, especially in, in this kind of global um, world we live in where these it's like storms hitting us all the time, you know, so who builds the strongest houses? Um, and yeah, I would say that the indigenous have a much better chance of withstanding it. That's what I did. Really, a question for all of us who are not Tangata defending. 
Now this question will go out to the person who wanted to know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Very I mean, who should carry out the indigenization of design and placemaking mm -hmm. in our team world? And how should others be a good ally? Well, how's the boat doing? Is it a break time yet? Or is it, <laughs> can I get another glass of wine? Um, well, sis. <laughs> yeah, well, the other part of the yeah, the, the tensions or maybe experiences that um, my partner and I are having because you know I remember asking her about Titi and what should I say today <laughs> and she was like oh you should give them a history lesson like you know right from the Hifaka Putana to like Titi to like Matiki Mai and the work of Moana Jackson I'm like wow okay <laughs> I'm like, everyone knows no. who Pan and Newton is right <laughs> yeah, yeah well it's um you know and I think in that conversation it was just acknowledging the work and whether it be fortunately or unfortunately uh, but just the work that Tangata Whenua have done to get to this position mm -hmm. and being able to lead these conversations again mm -hmm. and you know when you know just conversations around Tino Rangatina Tangata Mana Motahake and our positioning in, in today's landscape or in the landscape of Aotearoa culturally for me I think there's a couple of shifts. I think I was, I'll speak to the first shift maybe before I met Panya. <laughs> was, you know, I felt like there was like a entitlement is the wrong word, but just this maybe fear is, yeah. <laughs> is the right word. But, you know, like graduating from university on this high, moving into this professional space. Um, and always feeling the need to want to be in front of the room because maybe the Pacifica voice isn't being heard. And, or maybe it was just another part of me just wanting to be in front of the room, but... <laughs> maybe it's that one. But, um, and then, really my... Because, again, going back to the conversation that I had, but culturally, always understanding my, relation, my relationship with uh, Tangata Whenua, and that was something that was just drilled into me. And, when we, were, when we were young and, you know, we were born into the PIPC Newton and they, uh, Samoa and Yue and Cook Island, had a very strong relationship with some of some of Fenua and a lot of my older siblings grew up in the days of the Dawn Rains and the Polynesian Panthers and at that point in time, in collective hardship, that collectivism was their strongest point. So around that time, there was a very strong sense of, sense of collective identity. And around the, the times of Bastion Point, and so a lot, a lot of these things happening, which, you know, four or five decades later, we don't really have that strong, strong collective understanding anymore. Um, but then, then going into this process myself of, I feel like my, my greatest understanding of Māori tanga and titiriti and these understandings of the hardships of tanga te whenua in, in this day and age is actually during my time over in Ihimata and that was where I met Pania and Rishi, like me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it was, and, and then just learning, just I had to unlearn after that and going through this process of studying architecture and this perception that the architect needed to be in front of the room, needed to be the one holding the pencil, needed to be the one illustrating the nice pictures, needed to be the one telling the vision. Again, this is debatable. <laughs> At the very least, that's, that's how I saw it all. And then going over to Ihumata and just unlearning all of that. And really it was a, where I had my greatest, strongest sense of being Samoan and my role with inside the Papakaing and Hapu really needed to translate to me professionally and needed to translate into my studio. And so what that looks like is, I believe our role as a, professionally as architects, but also our role as Pacifica is really to uplift the mana of Tangata Whenua and in whichever way they see that. Mm -hmm. And that's non-negotiable mm -hmm. from a cultural perspective and also in, in seeing out the vision of what Titi actually stood for in 1840, personally. So, 
I don't see us in the, as Pacific as in the front of the room unless that conversation with Mana Flino has happened. If they want us to be in front of the room, that can happen. Uh, but I saw uh, the biggest shift in me was no longer wanting to be in front of the room, but to be supporting my partner and, and her whānau, or our whānau, and seeing out their visions for their whenua. And if we can translate that professionally in every single office that we sit in today, then Aotearoa will be a completely different place in five, ten years from now. Wow. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say that to our Māori members as well. How should we be a good ally? Left. Uh, tēnā koe, Lama. Um, I think a uh, good example of, of being a good ally is, um, you know, the you know, your project at Glenn uh, Primary School, you know, where you uh, <laughs> were asked to, um, to design and, and build a whale, uh, but, but understood that um, what was first appropriate was to get the blessing of, of Mana Whenua and Kawiro Aumaki. Mm. And I think um, that requires some sensitivity and it requires relationships as well. And I think um, that's something that uh, Albert referred to earlier was um, the strength of the relationships that you build over time and, uh, and effectively the credibility that you build as someone who is honouring, you know, honouring of those relationships. So I think um, that to be a good ally is to have good relationships mm. um, and through your good relationships you will have good cultural sensitivity and understanding of histories and, uh, and once you have, have that groundwork um, in place, then, then you can confidently place yourself in relationship to those people mm. and, and neither party feels that either is overstepping the mark. People know each other, they know um, where they stand mm. and they know that um, there's a time uh, to support and there's a time to lead. And um, so I think that's, um, I guess, a very simple observation around being a good ally. And I extend that not just to um, Come to Moana Nui, um, to to Parker in particular. Mm. Uh, it's the same um, same conversation I had with Parker at uh, parties, and my first conversation was, "Where are you from?" And they go, mm, where, "Where am I from? Um, well, uh, where do you feel most connected to?" Um, well, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've got this place in the Coromandel and um, our family have had it for three generations and uh, I guess if, if I had to be pushed, that's the place I feel most connected to. And, uh, and then our next question is, what's your relationship with Mana <laughs> in, 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 in that particular area? Do you know um, how your family got to have that land and how Ngāti Tamatera do not have that land and so on? So th this is the process of, of what I call becoming indigenous. It is to be deepen your connections to the people, uh, deep, and if you deepen your connections to the people of the land, then you can become an ally in looking after the land, and it needs a lot of looking after. We've got a, um, a giant umu down here that, that was discussed earlier. There's, a, there's an enormous sinkhole that, that uh, <laughs> Phil Wiyogi here is on behalf of Ngāti Whātua. Urake is, is monitoring. Um, you know, these are, these are issues that we need everyone involved in um, mm. and um, because, you know, uh, we, we've all got to be allies to Papatuāruku and, and Tangaroa uh, and we can do that best if we've got good relationships. Good on. I might reframe my answer in terms of some of the other roles I hold in my life. Um, this is a bit of a word jumble, but I am the co-director of the Indigenous Peoples Work Program for the International Union of Architects, there we go, um, which is um, the International Union of Architects is like UN for architecture. It was established in France. It's a very Europe-centric thing. Um, and last year I was approached by a very good friend of ours, Patrick Stewart, another Indigenous architect from uh, the Killer Whale clan in um, Turtle Island, northern sort of Canada, um, to join him, to sit alongside him in the role of co-director um, because of the, as Flo was describing, the established relationships had between 
um, Ngā Aho and our Māori Sign practitioners here in Aotearoa and quite a lot of um, practitioners across Turtle Island um, broadly, so both Canada and the um, US. So I'm not there just because I like um, acronyms, but I, I was there because I was asked. And that puts me back in this position of allyship in a really interesting way, because here I, I am a Māori wahine, and I can speak to my experience and what my whānau were experiencing, my hapu, my iwi. I can work with other iwi and hapu to use my work experience to support them to get better outcomes. And now I'm finding myself in global dialogues having those discussions as well. And a lot of them, again, to, to reinforce what I was speaking to, is coming about through relationships. I found myself in this really weird situation where I was being asked by the city of LA to help them with a policy they were writing about land acknowledgements. <laughs> Literally the entire policy started with, we want to acknowledge that there are indigenous people in LA. And that was kind of it. <laughs> Um, but three years previous, their mayor had actively said they didn't have Indigenous people. So I found myself in a Zoom call with all these people talking about Tiaranga and what people like Phil had been doing, what the Auckland Council had been doing. So in that role, what I do as an ally is I use my experience to illustrate ways we have gone about having these conversations to illustrate the kinds of aspirations they might want to have for themselves, and to illustrate the kinds of pressures we've put on our non-Māori entities, um, organisations, councils, to me to me, to say, we've actually, we've, we've managed to do this. Now, we have some different mechanisms to hand for us, things like Te Tiriti or Waitangi, that give us levers to pull from, but, you can still use some of these examples to help you. And I basically just gave them some clues, sent them some websites, had a discussion with them. This was the weird LA time warp I was in. Um, and they went great, and then I got out of the way. So for me, at that point, it was being able to go, I have had X number of years of experience. It always finds itself in this position all the time. And Albert, you know, we, we all actually are often. So, I've used my experience as a Māori wahine in the job that I have to help actually quite a number of different indigenous kōrero, but it's never my place mm. to hold or push or um, then be the centre of that discussion. So for me it's been about using the experience. The word you used I think before was entitlement I think you don't, it, what you've got to draw from is, in like Albert, um, a beautiful privilege of you know knowing that you had your whenua you're not fighting to get it back mm. but then there are other things you can do from that position so what would you use to support Māori with that in mind I, I think that that would be what it is and when we as Māori travel overseas everybody looks at us like the rich cousins <laughs> from the city because for indigenous people we fundamentally we are we're the ones that have a lot of uh, rights relative to other indigenous people. We're, we're the ones that have a lot of, um, you know, practitioners relative to other indigenous peoples. We don't have heaps, but our relativity globally means that the allyship we actually have to have in our global indigenous community um, has been quite interestingly illustrated to me over the last few years. So I suppose I've been able to put myself in the shoes of Pākehā and Tangata and others practicing here in Aotearoa because I've been asked to sort of make similar commentary in Australia and, and overseas. Um, and that's been a kind of fascinating space. Mm. I'm just going to add a little something. Um, yeah, so something I often use to kind of relate to Kakea, trying to navigate their positionality and relationality is the fact that I did grow up in Australia, as I mentioned before, mm. and I had to interrogate myself around kind of where do I sit, what's my relationship to the land, what is my role. Um, I never practiced there, I just went to architecture school there, but um, like Charmaine, I also went to the University of Queensland, and um, I was really inspired by the Aboriginal Environments Research Centre that was part of our department, but didn't sort of filter into the undergraduate teaching, and I was just a scared teenager, so I didn't actually talk to them. But I listened to their lectures, 
and I kind of heard the work that was going on there. And I was really intensely interested in this idea of culturally uh, fit for purpose housing for Indigenous people, but also led by, or at least co-led by Indigenous people. And I found myself really in intensely interested in that work. But I had to question myself and think, well, okay, well, why is this interesting to me? Mm. And of course, it was my own Māori culture and whakapapa and my desire to connect with that. And then I felt that I had a fork in the road. I had two choices. One, I could say, look, I'm going to stay in Australia and I'm going to commit myself to working in this space as an ally and a supporter for Indigenous people and fully get behind them and do the learning that I need to do to be able to do that well. Or I'm just going to go back home to my own people and figure out who I am. Mm. And so, um, you know, I've told this story a lot. So, you know, I was a big part of that journey. I didn't know any Māori architects until my auntie was like, oh, I was in my second year maybe. She's like, oh, um, I must introduce you to our whanau ngaro. He's a, he's a Māori architect. He's doing the things you want to do. You know, like many of us, didn't have any professionals in the family, didn't know any of these people, didn't even know that there was Māori architects. So that was just, you know, another level again. And then the whole world opened up because I started meeting everyone and we had this incredible community. But the point of that discussion was just that I have been in that same position of going, who am I, what's my positionality, and what does that mean in terms of my role? Mm -hmm. And it's a really healthy thing to do, mm -hmm. and actually to keep doing regardless, because that'll shift depending on where you're working, where you're operating. And I think of that even on a, like a tribal or a regional level. So I don't just go, oh yeah, of course, someone invited me to go to, to Waipaunamu, and that sounds cool, and I must be brilliant, so I'm the right person for the job. I will ask myself, am I the right person for the job? And I'll also question the potential client. I'm like, okay, do you know you have got architects? Do you know their names? Oh, if you don't, I'll introduce you. Oh, okay. And sometimes they say, yep, cool, we all know that, but we want you for a specific reason. And I'll go, okay, cool, I can accept that. But then do you have students or young people coming through so that I don't have, I, you know, I want, I value this relationship, but really I want to be supporting your hapuranga te tanga, not me coming in as an outsider who doesn't have any papa here. And yeah, sure, you go back far enough, you can usually find some. But <laughs> what I'm saying is that's a healthy thing to do, whoever you are, wherever you're going. Question if you're the right person. I like to think of it as like a, a healthy insecurity. <laughs> don't be too confident that you're always the best and the right person because you might not be, and that's so fun. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Jane, just, just on that, sorry, would you like to speak to that other? Um, I was just going to take that segue because our next question is going to be our last now before we hand it over to anyone in the audience and they have a question. But Ali, you could talk to this too. Um, Got it now. To our cultural specificity, um, <laughs> understanding Tifana, deep knowledge of a people, their place, and their ways and their values. And uh, Jake, perfect segue to this. It's becoming more relevant, right? Been designed with indigenous communities, meaning one knows their limits with cultural knowledge and with humility accepts that the actual knowledge holders sit outside of the design team, right? Beyond the architects, beyond the designers. The knowledge holders reside within the community. They are the cultural experts, the people with the hours. So for us in this room, it goes deeper than saying, get a Maori Pacific person on the project. But instead, ask the question. Uh, so, any further thoughts around that? And Albert, anything else you want to add to that last question? <laughs> okay. I'll start from the uh, indigenous <laughs> question first <laughs> to get to the, the, the community knowledge. Uh, so, I thought it was important to talk about the question that Lama asked about the indigenizing design, what that means. And it's because I think a lot of the work that I'm doing and with Ro and Tukutau uh, and Lisa Peta, people I'm working with, uh, we're kind of in the middle of indigenizing design and what that means. And that's really important because one of the important things about that is it's not an isolated moment where we suddenly kind of indigenous the knowledge. I think it's got to come in a kind of a more holistic approach from the position of why do we need indigenous the knowledge? Well, we have to acknowledge the, the violence and the trauma that the colonial imposition that happened and the process that happened 
to, re to build some sort of reconciliation with people of the land here and a lot of the other indigenous community in the world to build a, a relationship, to reconciliate, to acknowledge the, the violence and the harm that's been caused over the last 200 years, a lot of those communities, and, and then the reparation that comes from that. The return of land, the acknowledgement of the uh, destruction of sacred places, uh, sacred temples, we have that, so many in the Pacific. And then the, uh, the, the process for indigenization then can happen. And of course, I think it's important that indigenization process is done by uh, people, the indigenous people of the knowledge. And what's really important in that project now we've come to realize is that, um, that if, we, if we as indigenous people become competent in our own knowledge, in our own Reo, Ngana language, then there's a moment there, and I think some of us here have uh, experienced that, when you confront other people, if not in the Pacific, it would be North America or in Australia, where you start to kind of, uh, compare your knowledge. You know, what is your word for space? What is your word for water? Mm -hmm. So rather than routing your, your discursive or your, your, your discourse through the language of the masters or the colonial masters, you actually compare item per item through your own language. Your buildings, elements of building through, you know, the front, the back, the sides of the building, because they carry so much different uh, elements that the, the, the kind of translations into English or other European language and then back to the indigenous language, you go through such a process that you lose so much. So on that level, it's really important for indigenous, for design, for us, for projects that we're doing so we can go to Australia, we can go to North America, we can talk among us in the Pacific, because we, we have a genealogy that's connected, where we compare and talk about these things and why our architecture has moved so slowly in terms of invention from the Palangi um, architecture. So I think that's, that the process of indigenization is important and I think most of us are working in that space. And the holistic view of that is that reconciliation, reparation, indigenization of the knowledge and the last part that a lot of us now, I mean, the, 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 the thing that's kind of in the air but no one talks about at the moment is decolonization. What, what is decolonization if we've gone through this process? And one of the things that's really important now for the work that we're doing is that after doing all this work, you can't put decolonization back on us. And I think it's a shared process between indigenous people and the, uh, the people who did the harm and the trauma and, and the knowledge bases that carry with that. And what I think is important in that decolonization process is that you make sure you put in place uh, thing, you know, laws, whatever you might call it, so that the trauma is not, re people are not re-traumatised, but also those violence can't happen in the future. So, so you can build a different world. And I think it, that's, a, that's a collective process. It can't be just indigenous people. It's all other people who are part of the process. Now, I, I, I look over there, there's my mate, um, who's doing some work with us. There's also process of decoloniality, but I'll let Atta talk about that, which I think is a really important shift in the discourse at least. The decoloniality is the process where naming and also looking at, you know, what we call Samoan, Tonga, or, or even the word indigenous, is in fact already a, 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 a process of modernity that's in, imparted to us. Um, and so there are different processes and strategies that you have to go through that. So we go back to you know, then your question about, what was the last question? Uh, cultural specificity, specificity. And even amongst indigenous people on projects, right? We may not know the tikan, we may not know the personal intimate values, so ask the question, who else could do this better? Or yeah. 
Sounds good. I'll pass it on to the others because you're probably more qualified. <laughs> um, mm. I, I was trying to think about examples. For me, this might sound a bit like a paradox, but I'm, I guess that's the way my brain is working at the moment. The deeper I go into my own understanding of Tao Māori and then Iwitanga and Habutanga and Maifano and Tikanga and Kawa and, and all of those layers, so the more specific I get, um, the wider my understanding of Temuana and Miyakiwa becomes. Um, this is a random example, but Kapahaka many years ago, I remember um, Kimi Titan. I'm so sorry if you ever watched this, I'm bastardising your kōrero, but was talking about the process of um, coming onto a marae um, for him as a Ngāti Hine Tāne, so quite specific to him and his iwi. And he talked about how the first, you know, the wave of manuhiri coming onto the ātia was actually um, not just the domain of Tumatoina, which most people assume the ātia is the domain of, but actually, Kine Moana brings you on, washes on the manuhiri and, and steps back. He, he sort of talked about it in that respect, and it was a part of a wider corridor of also trying to decolonise our own understanding of the atua, because so many people only think about them, the atua as being male, and he was trying to explain that from their perspective, there were 140 atua, 70 male, 70 female, it was all in balance. So he was talking about different female atua and their roles. And, so he was explaining this one moment, right? Thinking about Hinemwana um, as the atua of the kind of top current of the ocean, bringing in you as Manuhiri and coming back. That's a very, very, very simplified version of this portal. But I go back to being in Hawaii, surrounded by these guys, listening to um, Athol and Lili Kala and others talking about the idea that the, the marae, the cleared space, the marae atia, might have actually come from this idea of um, the space between the island and the outer atoll and that actually there's a sort of there's a gap in the atoll where you as a visitor the manuhiri might be coming in through that gap you're being brought in and that is your first relational exchange it's literally the ocean bringing you in and i'm going ah <laughs> sort of connecting to this corridor i heard from papa Hemi 12 years ago about tikanga in a very specific way related to a very specific kōhiri we were having up north and going, oh yeah, that just sounds like these guys are talking about an old tikanga that related to the ocean, literally the top current bringing in this waka to be greeted by the people truly of that island is part of that tikanga. That's the exchange. So I think about that all the time, is that the deeper I get, which I need to do for me, not for projects, not for architecture, just for life, actually is helping me to understand our connection, our genealogy, literally our whakapapa back to how and why we've established all those things. I remember listening to the Tokelau and priest that used to speak to my nana, and when I am down in Kaitavu territory, they feel like they're speaking Tokelau to me. <laughs> There's aspects of it that the, the heavy kith sound to me sounds a lot like Tokelan being spoken, or at least the priest I remember in my mind. You know, there are all these funny relationships I think about that specificity is an incredibly important thing because I think it's giving us back our mana motuhake, our sense of self. But I also find, for me anyway, in my research, that it's giving me a great connection to everyone else. Yeah. Very well said, thank you. We're going to end that question there. Yeah. I'm going to pass over to the um, Ruf, I saw Peter. Yeah. Um, but we're just mindful of the time. <laughs> about any time. I mean, we could sit here and chat about this all night, and I've got a lot of questions instead of shouting. However, we've got to move on. I just want to open it up to the floor if anybody has a question for our panelists. Um, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around. If not, I've got a question for the panelists and then we'll finish it there. Life. Okay. Wow. Okay. Question. It's an open question. What should our next elected government's top priorities be? <laughs> I did give you guys a chance. What? 
What, what should our least elected government's top priorities be for housing Mali and Pacific communities? One oh. sentence. One, One sentence. sentence. Perfect. <laughs> Give us more money. <laughs> Give us the money and step out of the way. I think that was the theme of the last Mali Housing Conference, wasn't it? And I believe if there's a Pacifica Housing Conference one day, this should be the same thing. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, one sentence. <laughs> 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 should I summarize now? <laughs> well, I think just um, innovation um, and almost like designing from the ground up here. Mm. Um, economically, communities, family, how long, how long do people live um, building groups with these things? Um, I guess one sentence, uh, a Māori housing authority is one of them, and, uh, and perhaps a Pacifica housing authority as well. Mm. Uh, we do need end-to-end -end, um, um, support for, for housing. Uh, the current government has only just begun to spend what they were spending in Māori housing in the 1980s. So we really just returned to that level of investment uh, at that time in equivalency terms. Um, whatever the next government does, it cannot spend less than it's doing now. Kilda. Well, um, I would like housing to not be seen as um, just building houses. Um, I have spent a lot of conversations recently thinking about uh, the fact that the housing discussion and the health discussion needs to be the same conversation. Um, because when I'm talking to Fano about Rangatahi youth offenders and everybody's favourite um, buzzwords of ram raids these days, it's because um, we don't have you know stable housing, stable food source, good education, all the things that actually give our kids um, a sense of place. So. Yes, those housing authorities need to exist, but it needs to um, be beyond just walls. That's our political spiel, eh? Hey. Tax the hell out of those people who buy more houses <laughs> and <laughs> give it to the... To the... Well, uh, to the... To the... To the... Yeah. I'll leave some more. Look, on behalf of Charmaine and I, um, I just want to extend our massive thank yous um, for everybody for attending, especially our six uh, panelists, um, you guys are knowledge holders, you guys are leaders in the space. Um, it's really great that we start these Talanoa so that we can better inform what our next generation of architects are doing in the classrooms or in the studio spaces. It's extremely important. And I asked the question just previously, why now? because we have to uh, play me as that. So uh, once again, thank you to our gym sponsors who couldn't make it for this um, quarter all today. Um, we also want to thank um, NZIA for supporting this event. We have a rep here. Um, we want to thank our PDCP fighting crew for organizing our and setting up our chairs um, and our uh, IT also. Um, thanks to everyone who has helped to bring together the last three, four sessions we've got Val. Uh, we've got Lady as well. Thank you. Tamara, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, just want to say thank you also to, um, you know, to you guys. Um, we know you could have been catching up on some sleep watching the All Blacks or the Rugby World Cup. I won't mention the blue and white team that looked disastrously bad in the weekend. Um, <laughs> But also, just thank you for your time. And I know the time is really a fear since this day and age. Um, but we also really appreciate you guys attending and uh, showing your presence. I just want to acknowledge the Matu here from Urake Nasi Fatua for your attendance. Thank you, Matu. Um, and on that note, I just want to uh, perhaps give you guys a uh, Gift. Don't get too excited by it. Any chip discounts? Do you need chip discounts? 
I don't know. Three houses. Okay. Just. 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 passing of Patu Pohepa. Uh, when I first started work on the house, uh, he and Margaret Mutu, we consulted with him. We, he came to a couple of meetings, so he was quite instrumental in giving his blessing to have this house built here. So he passed away last week. Yeah. Yeah. So just acknowledging that. He was a professor at Māori Studies. You set up Māori Studies. Yeah. Okay, last but not least, I just want to thank my colleague Charmaine, Dr. Charmaine. Uh, her and I have just been banging heads and uh, <laughs> putting uh, scriptures and proverbs and stories out uh, for the last three lecture series that we have, and I think we've done a pretty good job, Charmaine. Um, if I may say so myself, I just want to also acknowledge our um, Associate Professor Mike Davis, who's also been in support as well as um, Andrew, Professor Andrew Barry and others as well, Julia Gatley, uh, Professor Mike Austin also. And on that note, I'll give uh, a little to Shana for a Can we please put our hands together for a final applause for our great